So, you know, this this idea of we can really be imagining and sending these phrases, you know, may you know true happiness, may you be free from suffering. And it's it's really interesting coming again, coming back from retreat and being away. And there's so much suffering that's so blatant in our city, you know, just driving across town. And to have that capacity and to recognize it, that the heart rises up with compassion for others who are suffering mm -hmm. and to really make that deliberate. Um, so yeah, we can almost think of it as the middle figure, finger to apathy and self-criticism, right? That's our second, our second. So any, any questions on like how we could, again, not like I have to do these, but how we could see the presence of loving kindness and compassion in our day to day, they like pay attention. Yes, yes, please. I, I more have a question about like they seem kind of similar. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure what the distinction is exactly between Sweet loving question. kindness and yeah. passion. Yeah, and in a lot of traditions they kind of make them a little mushy um, and it makes sense. They're really, there's a similarity, but I think, um, I think the specificity is really helpful. Wow. What was that? How was a young person running by and ringing the door? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Empathetic joy. <laughs> like really rejoicing in that. It was like their little prank or their little excitement. Who knows? Oh, <laughs> uh, it's never happened for. <laughs> it's very auspicious, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so yeah, with loving kindness, there's this real quality of you know this core warmth, care, friendliness. You know that sense that we we just feel we can feel it really naturally towards things like uh, our pets or the natural world, just a sense of like love and care. Right. Um, and then we meet suffering and the suffering could be once again, for someone we care about. And there's a different quality. There's one thing of like, I love you. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> now that we've gone too far. <laughs> for friends online we were having a doorbell um intruder <laughs> yes doorbell bomb yeah. um it's getting a little shaming out there or, uh, <laughs> yeah um and so there's like, there's, there is a qualitative difference to like wanting and wishing for happiness and wanting and wishing to be free from suffering. They are, you know, in order to really be happy, we have to be free from suffering, but we can also have just this desire to really support our happiness, our well-being. And then there can be like having coffee, right? Is, I guess it could be about alleviating suffering but it's, you know, they're, they're slightly different. And it's interesting because in different traditions, you will hear people start with compassion and then other traditions start with loving kindness. And some really believe that the flowering of compassion emerges from loving kindness. But I think it's really worth checking it out. And when you're trying these practices, either as phrases as we'll do together or in the world, like, how does it feel different? I mean, I really notice the loving kindness just truly at the embodied level, kind of like up, lift, feeling through the whole body. And with compassion, it's far more centered in the heart and a little bit more of like, I don't want to say heaviness in the bad way, but like weightiness. So thank you for your question. Hi, this question is kind of related to the last one. Yeah. I heard you mention that what some people call compassion fatigue is really empathic burnout. I think you said or um, some, empathic some version stretch. of that. Yeah. And I, I've been struggling with this. I've been trying to wake up my heart after a time that I had not realized I had been just shut down. Mm. And I think part of it was feeling 
so many levels of suffering from my own to you know the whole yeah. world and it just started pressing in and so my question of you know how do you open your heart yeah. without feeling it in such a way that it just becomes too much so, yeah thanks for the tenderness of your question i imagine many people relate to that it's a big question um it really is this kind of razor's edge between kind of falling into despair and overwhelm or getting kind of like rigid and dry and like pushing away the suffering. And there is a place where we can, again, from resource, be offering compassion. And so often here when we practice compassion together, for others, we'll start by spending quite a lot of time practicing compassion for oneself. And um, that's a very like abstract and simple way but I to describe the difference. But I think it really qualitatively, there's, there's two pieces. One is like noticing the feeling, like what is the feeling of like giving and succumbing to despair, which is often associated with kind of a self-related concern like empathic distress, I can't, it's too much, right? And then when we're finding ourselves like truly in alignment with our compassion, there is, we kind of let go and give up on a sense of how it will come, mm -hmm. on an expectation of how whatever it is we care about will resolve or improve with our actions and behaviors. So I've um, had the good fortune to work quite a lot in the healthcare arena with burnout. And I think often there is this difficulty of like giving up an expectation of how it will go. And, you know, there's this favorite, like famous Lojong slogan of giving up all hope of fruition. And Pema Chodron, the Western Tibetan nun, when I asked her, like, how do we help people with burnout? Her answer was give up all hope of fruition. And that doesn't mean give up and stop caring and stop doing. It's give up this hope that you know how it will go. Like that you understand like your good intention and your effort. It's like we want to see it mirrored in front of us, but we don't know. You know, we plant these seeds and we have no idea. And yet we still do it. We do it without any expectation. We do it without measuring, right, how long it takes. And that includes for ourselves and others. So it's a small follow-up. Sure. It's a small, it's short. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm also finding that tuning into compassion is showing me all the ways that I'm wanting people to be free from suffering while in fact there's so many aspects of my life that create suffering for others right mm -hmm. into climate change by falling for instance mm -hmm. um and so for me the trying to open myself to compassion is creating a sense of dissonance mm -hmm. and that how can one deal with that yeah so, then you just you turn the compassion right there like there's really there's no like and, and I do think, you know, waking up to the harm that we perpetuate and create and the harms we've created in the past, right? And just by being alive and uh, those of us part of the dominant culture, right? Like the ways that we have harmed unintentionally and otherwise. And when compassion has that kind of flavor, though, that turns a bit towards kind of the despair, we have to, we have to in some ways, enact a little bit of the fierce compassion, because despair will not help us make change and it won't help us like take the next step, whether that's, you know, learning more and educating ourselves or supporting and donating otherwise. So I think it's really tough because I, the despair is so natural, especially when we are first waking up to pain and suffering, whether it's our impact in the world or the suffering of other beings, we just can't land there. So thank you. Yeah empathetic joy, right? We need it. Like the compassion goes here, right? As we are, you know, putting a middle finger to apathy and self-criticism. And then, yeah, it's kind of nice. It's like the ring finger. It's our connection to others. Um, all the good parts about relationship and connection, not the, the state enforced marriage thing, right? Just the, 
connection and uh, empathetic joy, it really allows our, our hearts to be lifted by the goodness of others. I mean, there are infinite opportunities on a day-to-day -day basis. Like there's so much, I'm looking at you all like, wow, <laughs> you're here dedicating yourselves to these practices, right? Like there's so much of it. Um, and it is, you know, a practice we can do for the wholesome aspects of ourselves as well. Really letting ourselves feel a sense of joy. This has such a loaded word, but for our virtues. And the way I think of that, that word is kind of for the qualities in us that are kind of really already radiating the goodness inside. Because it happens. Like, it's not like, oh, I'm going to practice Buddhism and then I'll be good. Like, already good. Already good. Sometimes we get like, you know, we fall asleep a little bit and maybe forget to be good, but already good. And that joy that we can feel when our goodness is radiating through and the joy we can feel with others. So this is, I, I mean, there's one of these Brahma Vihara four measurable practices that I think we miss out on and that there's so much to gain from. It's really empathetic joy. And I'm curious, did anybody experience empathetic joy today? Any rejoicing in the goodness? Yes. Let someone mind in that. Yeah. Um, I I'm having a little date with myself today, so it's really that's joyful in and of itself. But I've become a, a parent recently, and uh, to do FaceTime with my daughter and to see her just just get yes. so excited when I saw her, it was just mm -hmm. ah, most joyful. Beautiful. Yeah. Yes, and I I actually really think watching parents and children can be such a source of empathetic joy too. just that attunement and resonance. And yeah, thank you. Anybody else? If you didn't notice that today, we really got some work to do. Yes, Lucas. Coming to you. Hello. Hi. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, yeah, so I too talked to an ex, um, <laughs> and, uh, and it was a really great conversation. Uh, her mom died a couple mm -hmm. months ago from brain cancer and throughout the whole process, like she has two sisters and they were fighting like, and, you know, bickering of, you know, like you're not giving, you know, so-and-so enough attention. There's all this gossip and drama mm -hmm. and, uh, all this stuff. And, and, uh, so that's just the history of, of, you know, sort of like, as I was talking to her, you know, you know, like, you know, I guess before her mom died and then I talked to her today and she said that, you know, she's been, Christmas with her sister and that, um, she, you know, had like enjoyed spending time with her sister's mm. kids. And it was just like this, like complete shift in the way that she was sort of, mm. um, in her, and I was kind of expecting, you know, because like, there's a, a lot of history of her just kind of talking shit about her sisters, right. And her mom. And, and that's kind of what I, I'd come to expect, you know, to just sort of like listen to her you know, kind of rant. Um, and, and it was, and it was different. And, um, hmm. and that made me really happy that there had been this sort of like, um, you know, like this weight that had dropped off of her and, and yeah. her siblings. And so that made me feel really happy that, hmm. you know, things are, things are going to get better for her. So hmm. anyways, that, that was, that was nice. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Getting free. Wow. Yes. Wanda. So I went to um, Bolinas this morning and was sitting there just watching the waves and watching people surf. And there mm. was this young person um, that was really struggling to paddle out. And I was just like feeling a lot of like compassion for them. And 
they weren't even able to catch the wave, but they were riding the waves on their belly and just giggling. <laughs> and I was just like so filled, um, so filled with joy in that moment. Mm, yeah. Thank you. And just one other thing I want to share is um, I'm a first grade teacher and um, we call, I, I didn't come up with this term, one of the first graders did, but they called it shoy. And it's sharing others' joy. Oh, um, and we kind of turned it into like a verb. Mm -hmm. Like someone would be like, you're showing right now. <laughs> I have a really quick one. Um, it has to do with furry, furry animals. That um, We have a cat and dog that have been getting to know how to live together. <laughs> and today, the dog was on the bed. And the cat, when he got up on the bed, she rolled over and just played with him okay. and it almost invited him in. And then they were just lying there together. And I swear to God, I was just like, this is so, <laughs> it's almost like a finally. <laughs> and it was so small, but I was like, I gotta take a picture. You know, I just wanted to kind of remember that. Mm. But I could, it was really great. Yeah, thank you. And I think we see in a way, right, like how these weave together, like we couldn't just have the loving kindness because, well, there's suffering. And then we couldn't really just stay with the suffering because, wow, there's actually like a lot of goodness and rejoicing that's possible. You know, all of these like weave together. I think equanimity is probably if empathetic joy is the most uh, ignored or like least appreciated equanimity is the least understood, right? And I think can feel very complex and, and uncertain. So with that, anybody feel an equanimity today? <laughs> How would you describe that feeling or that sense? How would you notice if there was equanimity in your day? A little pinky. <laughs> Well, uh, after a, a friend of mine showed me a secret spot for foraging uh, mushrooms today and having a lovely walk in nature and sharing that moment where I was receiving that moment of empathetic joy, I believe, um, in sharing a secret and understanding the significance of that. Um, after that, like the day, like time and space and getting from one place to another and then finally ending up here with a half an hour before this started to have a tamale. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I mean, it was just like, like the equanimity of like the being in the zone was just um, a beautiful place to um feel like it was all right mm. and it was just it was lovely it was precious yeah. wow that might go yeah it might be really more heavily in the empathetic joy there but beautiful <laughs> and i can't believe someone shared their mushroom spot with you whoa sweet. <laughs> sweet. are you sure they're not planning on <laughs> okay all right yeah okay yes hi hi <laughs> this morning i went with coco for a walk hmm. coco's a dog it's my dog <laughs> like this very cute very cute <laughs> and uh i don't know why he lately is looking after me Hmm. So he goes, he walks, and then he stops and he turns around hmm. and looks for me. And I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to tell him, I'm not, I'm not that old, you old dog. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. But I was all, all the time thinking about him and remem remembering that when we took him from uh, place where they, they had dogs and cats in a very poor condition. Mm -hmm. And he was like the skinny. Yeah. And he would run away mm -hmm. all the time and mm -hmm. run away from the windows. He would, mm -hmm. he was amazing. And I was thinking, how can an animal mm -hmm. become so sweet and so tender and so giving? Yeah. So 
I wish for all of us. Thank you. A lot of love and yeah. a very good year. Mm. All of us. Thank you. Yeah, and that's such a beautiful description of equanimity, actually, is that we just don't know how things will change, right? And there can be, you know, one way I heard described on retreat, which I liked, is feeling a sense of balance in the middle of it all. And so, right, you know, interestingly, the cats that um, I adopted also were terrified of me in the beginning, right? And just that sense of openness and not knowing like this could change. It could be, it could be different. And that of course goes both ways with, with equanimity. So recognizing the one, I thought your equanimity score was going to be amazing mushroom day and then car crash and being like, all of it is okay. <laughs> right. Cause that's kind of the equanimity of, of recognizing that things are always changing. They are always shifting. And if we think that what's happening is a problem, like just wait. If we think what's happening is great, well, maybe wait. You know, like, it's just changing and changing, and that is so liberating. Not thinking we can control it or know it or actually have to understand what's happening. Like we are so zoomed in, we don't really get to see the fullness of the picture. I have a quick one. I'm not sure if this is more about patience or more about equanimity yeah. or how they connect. Right. But I had to take care of a piece of business today that involved going to a county social services office. Yes. And, um, you know, waiting, waiting in a wait, you wait in a line to get inside the building. You get in one by one and then you go into another line. And then you go up to a little window and they either help you or they don't help you. And if they can't help you, they give you a number to go sit in a chair <laughs> and wait for another person to get in another line. Mm. So I did that. And then I, you know, and I brought a book and I looked around and there was a little really young girl in a yellow ski jacket translating for her mom mm. talking to the social worker and she was just so cute and so exuberant and I saw the social worker kind of crack and start like mm. being human you know oh man yeah as a social worker I'm like ouch yeah yeah I know it <laughs> and there was another moment when like the line went around and there were a couple chairs kind of behind the line and these two men who did they looked really tired they sat down in the chairs and this guard for absolutely no reason was coming by and like would like told them to not sit in the chairs and to like stand. Mm. And um so they kind of got up for a second and then the guard left and I and I I didn't speak the same language as the man who was right next to me, but I was just like, you sit and I'll I'll cover for you. <laughs> but the whole the whole experience was just about sort of going with yeah this situation and realizing how fortunate I am really, because this is not like the story of my life. Mm -hmm. I don't do this all the time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. And then there was a, a really great person at the very end of all the lines who I got to go sit in her office and talk to her. And she couldn't solve my problem actually, but she, you know, she mm. did her best. And yeah. um, so it was anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. And I, and I think your question in the beginning about patience, like patience would be a natural manifestation of equanimity because we really recognize again, like we're not in control. So many things happen outside of our realm of understanding. There's so much more complexity to everything that we can ever actually know. Like there is such a, you know, I really think of equanimity as like a deep knowing of the wisdom of, of reality, seeing reality as it is, which is impermanent, ever-changing, interconnected. And to be kind of resting in equanimity for a while, which it sounds like you were able to do, you then can have joy mm -hmm. and compassion, right? They all come up. So yeah, beautiful. Wonderful. So I think we feel pretty good about our pinky finger. Uh-huh. Yeah. Jimmy, would you mind handing out these cords for folks? Thank you. So uh, for, for folks online, you have your fingers, right? 
everybody got their fingers and some, even if you don't, you could imagine having fingers and some. Great. And for friends here, I'm going to ask us to take a cord and we're going to tie four knots in this cord, tie them towards the middle. And we're going to practice with them really just for a moment, allowing our mind to rest in loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. And if you're not so sure, if you want to commit and set an intention for these, that's okay. You can just enjoy the cord and, you know, use it as a bookmark later. Mm -hmm. But if this is something you feel kind of compelled or interested in, like, hmm, can I make these Brahma Viharas part of my new year intention? Um, I really invite you to do so. So yeah, just kind of tie. And as you're tying each one, really the thinking of the loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity, it's organic hemp, so, okay, in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> and it actually is in a Rastafari color pattern, but luckily, it's so short, the amount you're getting, that you are not adhering to that as well. Just to... <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you're just getting what you get. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't that light. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy, for cutting these. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Ooh, I got red and green. You want to have one? You having this one? No? Yeah. Friends online, if you end up coming to the center, we'll save you some here. All right. I'm going to grab that one was off the roof. So if you want to stand up and stretch for a moment, you are welcome. So we're then going to do a sit with each of these. And then you'll ask your friend next to you to help you tie it on your wrist at the end. So kind of having your cord near you, receiving the practice. <clears throat> so everybody has four little knots it doesn't really matter where they are but in the middle is good so that when you tie it on they don't get cut off accidentally. I didn't know that we only used four and made a lot. Is that okay? Sorry? I didn't know we only needed four and made a lot. Okay? Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> many, many iterations of the Brahma Viharas. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so then settling in, putting your intention cord somewhere close so it can absorb your practice.
finding a posture that can really support your practice. So that includes a sense of uprightness through the spine. Finding a sense of softness and ease through the face and the chest and the belly. for a couple breaths, really helping us find this balance between the vividness, the uprightness, and the ease. So inhaling, almost as though inhaling from the very root, your sacrum, all the way to the crown. And then exhale, gently releasing, relaxing, and feeling ease. Inhale, inviting the vividness, the uprightness, Exhale, releasing, relaxing. And continuing with this flow of breath, inviting in these two qualities. If you're feeling a little sleepy or tired, no problem to have your eyes slightly open or even invite your spine to be more upright, maybe pulled forward on your chair. Even sitting at the edge of the chair to ensure that uprightness. Taking a moment to really feel this place, this space, this moment. This third day of the new year. This wonderfully dark night. And the chill in the air. And for those of us in the center, really feeling the presence of other beings here with us. And for friends online, feeling the gathered connection, shared virtual space. And consider receiving the next breath as though it were a precious gift, unexpected, with the curiosity and joyfulness of the present. See and notice if there's anywhere in the body that could use a little more ease. Maybe there's tension between the brows or at the shoulders. Okay. And invite through the exhale, a sense of ease and relaxation to any areas in the body needing just a bit more attention, care.
Noticing the body and its relative state of stillness, not moving to go anywhere, not needing to do anything. And feeling the stability of that stillness, almost as though the body were like a mountain. <laughs> And inviting a quality of more inner silence by following the breath. Noticing the subtle sensations of breath in and out of the nostrils. And by gathering our full attention and awareness there, it may help us settle the mind, settle the inner speech. Inhaling, feeling those subtle sensations of breath traveling in. And exhaling, noticing how those subtle sensations are just a bit warmer. No matter how many times the mind gets distracted, we can continue coming back, noticing the breath. With as much kindness as possible, and care. And even though many thoughts may be coming and going, just as when we first settle into practice, beginning of this evening, we may notice that there's space between the thoughts, space around the thoughts. There is a space from which the thoughts arise and return to. It's that sense as so is beautifully described that the thoughts are like clouds. Our awareness so vast, sky-like. See if you can feel awareness, not just in the head, but a sense of spacious awareness throughout the body. And even beyond the body, extending in front of you and behind you, above you and below you, all around.
And then gently shifting our mind, our t attention and awareness from breath and body awareness to the mind and imagination. And bringing to mind this first quality, this first Brahma Vihara, first finger. And considering these beautiful phrases. May I be happy and know the true causes of happiness. May all beings be happy and know the true causes of happiness. Just a couple more times to really see if these words can land beyond just a thought, but a, a feeling and sense state. Notice if the heart can lean out towards this desire and intention. <clears throat> May I be truly, genuinely happy, know the causes of my happiness. May all beings be truly happy, <clears throat> know the causes of happiness. Checking in and noticing how that feels in the body. Maybe an image arises, maybe a reflection from the day. May I be happy, know the true causes of happiness every day. May all beings be happy and know the true causes of happiness every day. And then shifting blossoming into this practice of compassion. May I be free from suffering and its causes. May all beings be free from suffering and its causes. Really, again, noticing the body, feeling a sense of being stably rooted in the body, just like the tree that can extend its branches outward from the roots and the steadiness of the trunk, feeling a sense of being firmly rooted in the body. And then extending this beautiful, heartfelt aspiration of compassion. May I be free from suffering and its causes. May all beings be free from suffering and its causes. And again, considering the cultivation of this compassion each and every day. May I be free and more free of suffering and its causes each and every day. May all beings be free and more free of suffering and its causes each and every day. And then inviting and allowing our mind to alight on the goodness of other beings. May I rejoice 
in my own goodness. May I rejoice in the goodness of others. Really noticing again how this lands in the body and the heart, not even so much an understanding of the words, just the feeling. May I rejoice in my own goodness. May I rejoice in the goodness of others. And again, considering this as an ongoing, everyday intention, may I rejoice in my own goodness each and every day. May I rejoice in the goodness of other beings each and every day. And then shifting to great equanimity. May I find balance in the middle of everything. May all beings find balance and peace in the middle of everything. And checking in on the body and the breath. And once again, really inviting and noticing the quality of these phrases and how they may manifest or show up in the body, the mind, and the heart. May I find balance in the middle of everything. May all beings find balance, peace, in the middle of everything, just as it is. And then setting this intention. May I find the wisdom of balance and peace each and every day. May all beings find the wisdom of balance and peace each and every day. And then releasing the phrases and taking a couple moments to just feel this body as a body of loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. Feel those qualities always already here. And see if there is that calling, that intention, a desire to get closer, to make a habit, to make a path of these qualities. And if it's comfortable, placing palms together at the heart in a, a symbol, a reference of offering. And dedicating our practice together tonight to this outrageous and beautiful aspiration that all beings could know happiness and ease. All beings could be free from suffering 
all beings could know their true nature, that all and each being could be free. You all look transformed. I see compassion warriors here for sure. Yeah, just really wonderful to be here with you all. I so appreciate you showing up tonight. And um, yeah, really look forward to this year together. We're going to, sad to say that next week, Buddha is going to die. The last chapter of Old Path White Clouds, which has been a 13 months journey, the last chapter where Buddha dies. And it's very sweet, this reflection on death and impermanence. So, and then we'll start a new book by Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, um, really helping us do practices for inner healing. I think it'll be beautiful. So, whenever you can come, great. If you want to get the book, great. Not no problem. And I think we probably have other announcements. Jimmy, are there other things going on? Great. 